Good morning. Glad to welcome you to our live stream once again this Sunday. Glad you can join us. I'm trusting you are joining us. And so we're glad you're here with us. And uh, we have good news. Uh, we have a target date for reopening our church. That date is June 7th. June 7th. And so we're very thrilled and excited about that prospect. And so we're, we're going to reopen. And we want to do it wisely and, and as safely as possible. So we are going to have some it's going to be a little different than, than normal, uh, but we are going to have some uh, guidelines to follow. Uh, we're going to have one entrance along Singer Avenue here on the side of the church. Uh, ideally, every door will be open for you, so you will not have to touch a door. That, that's, that's the goal, at least. And so uh, the doors will be open. You won't have to worry about that. We'll have hand sanitizer here for you. Uh, we ask that if you are sick, if you are having a fever, if you have respiratory symptoms, if you have GI symptoms, uh, if you aren't feeling well, if you're immunocompromised, if you're going through any kind of medical treatment that you would stay at home, our live stream is going to continue. And so we will be streaming our entire service. You don't have to worry about that. There's no guilt or shame if you don't feel comfortable coming. We would encourage you not to if you don't feel comfortable. Uh, at first, we're going to begin as the governor moves us into the yellow phase. We're going to begin with smaller crowds. And so we're going to be looking at a crowd of about 25. And what that means is we're going to have reservations. And on a given day or time, TBD, uh, we will tell you when you can sign up via calling our church phone or checking our website and registering that way as well. If you make it one week and don't make it the next, we will rotate so people have a chance. We'll try to be as fair as we can for those who want to come. Um, there won't be nursery. There won't be child care. There won't be coffee. I know that's all sad, but we will be together worshiping the Lord, and we're excited about that. We would strongly encourage you to wear a mask, and we're going to make sure everybody is distanced in the church from each other uh, to be as safe as is possible. But we're, we're excited. So uh, stay tuned. More and more information will come out about that. June 7th is the target date. We're hoping that will uh, be the case. Uh, also, I just encourage you to say hi to one another in, in the chat and say hello, greet one another, uh, share, like our post. Uh, hopefully you like it. Hopefully you give a smiley face or something, not one of the angry ones. And so uh, uh, we hope you can do that and practice this little bit of community that we have here online as we get closer and closer. We're excited of gathering together to worship the Lord. And so let me invite you now to grab your Bibles, and we are continuing our study of the Gospel of John, and we're in John chapter 13. Jesus has just washed the feet of his disciples. Every mouth is wide open. What did he just do? We're going to kind of look at the aftermath of the foot washing uh, here this morning. John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. John 13 verses 12 through 17 will be our text. And uh, before we dive into the text, I uh, encourage us all, let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We're thankful, Lord, that you are a God who is sovereign. You are a God who is in control. You are a God who created heaven and earth. You are a God who reigns over heaven and earth. You are a God who reigns over us. And we praise You for that. We confess we are not worthy of You, Lord. We're not worthy to come into Your presence. We're not worthy even to sing Your praises. We're not worthy to pick up Your book. And yet, Lord, by Your mercy and Your grace, You extended Your love down to us in Jesus Christ. And so we thank You for Your love. We thank You, Lord, that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we praise You for this great gift. We praise You that You are a God who is perfect, a God who deserves all of our worship, a God who deserves all of our praise, a God who is triune, one God in three persons. And so, Father, we pray that our worship, our praise would be acceptable in Your sight. That our words, the words of our mouths, that the meditations of our heart would be acceptable and pleasing in Your sight, O oh Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. And so we come before You confessing our sins, confessing our guilt, Lord. Each one of us has sinned against You in many ways, in ways that we're not even aware of. We have sinned against You, Lord. And so we want to corporately together confess our sins. We want to pray, Lord, for Your Spirit to search our hearts and to try our thoughts and convince us of our guilt and reveal to us, Lord, our errors that we might 
confess our sins with our, our mouths and be reminded of Your provision for our sinfulness, which was Your own dear Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, convict us, Lord. Show us our failure. Show us our failure to love You supremely. Show us our failure to love our neighbors and love our enemies and love those who disagree with us as we love ourselves. Father, forgive us for this. And I pray that You would grant us repentance. That You would grant us grace to turn from our sins. Lord, we know that to follow Christ means we cannot embrace sin. And while we still fail You every day and will never be perfect in this life, we pray, Lord, that You would give us strength to turn from our sins and give us victory over the temptations in our lives. And Lord, keep the enemy from us. And so we pray for that, Lord. Pray for our our church family. Pray for the needs that are present here, Lord. We pray for the burdens, for the concerns, for the worries, for for those who are sick sick and dealing with, uh, Lord, this this virus. Lord, we praise You for those who've been tested positive, Lord, and aren't dealing with symptoms and, and, and the effects of it. We give You thanks for that, Lord. We pray for Your continued protection over our people and for uh, those who are caring for the sick, Lord, we pray for them as well. I, I, I pray for the Misano family, Lord, right now, dealing with uh, their son's surgery for a tumor. Lord, we pray that You would watch over them, encourage them, protect their, 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 their hearts, their minds, and watch over their son Dominic, Lord. I pray for that. Pray for him, and, and Lord, uh, keep guard over him, we pray. We thank You, Lord, for being a God who cares for us and cares for His people. And Lord, You never promise us Easy ease in this life. You never promise us health. You never promise us success in worldly standards, Lord, but you do promise us your love and you promise us your grace and you promise us, Lord, your presence for your people. And we praise you for that great gift. And so, Lord, I pray right now that as we open up the Bible, that you would just turn the lights on, Lord, in our in our eyes and open our ears, help us to see. I pray Your Spirit would illuminate the text in front of us. We love You, Lord. We thank You for being an awesome and great God. A God who is faithful. A God who is unchanging. A God who is certain in in every circumstance, Lord. We love You and we praise You and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, we're going to read from the Scripture this morning. And our Scripture reading is John chapter 13, verses 12-17. through And so this is what John writes. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We praise God for the giving of His Word. I like to often ask you a question to begin our time here together. And so uh, the question I want to ask this morning is, do you like being challenged? Do you like being challenged? I guess it depends on the challenge, right? I mean, if you're playing uh, ping pong, maybe that's your thing and you love a good ping pong challenge. Or maybe if you like playing uh, other games, you're all about it. But do you like being challenged in who you are as a person? Uh, Do you like your integrity being challenged? I would guess many, many people have major issues with Jesus because He challenges us. He challenges us. His very existence is a challenge to our own flesh. Because in our flesh, we are all about us. We are all about, number one, taking care of ourselves. We, we're born that way. We're born bent in on ourselves. Born to, uh, bent in on our flesh. We are born with the sinful self-absorbance. It's, it's who we are as humans. And so, We will strive and we will struggle to gratify self. And we will strive and struggle to glorify self. And we we will seek out our desires and our pleasures 
and our comforts often to our detriment. But that's who we are. That's who we are. And we believe that gratifying self and seeking our own pleasure and seeking our own glory is going to ultimately make us happy. And when you start to get your desires and when you start to seek all sorts of pleasures, what happens? You realize, well, that didn't really make me happy. That didn't really bring me contentment. And so you seek to do more and more and you find yourself in a kind of a spiral of misery when you're bent in on yourself that way. And so Jesus comes and He just questions us. He questions and confronts us in our self-idolatry. And He throws everything that our flesh naturally seeks on its own. He throws that upside down. All right? he, he, he throws it upside down. And so Jesus comes and He calls us to take the focus off of ourselves. And instead to put our focus on to God supremely. And then after God to put our focus on others. The two most important commandments, Jesus said, as He summed up the entire Old Testament, was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And He said the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what Jesus calls us to do. He, he, he's getting our attention and our focus off of ourselves. And then, not only does He teach us to live that way, but He actually lived that way Himself. And so what example did He give? He gives us a consistent example of humble service. And so last week we saw he washed the grimy, dirty, disgusting, filthy feet of his disciples. But even that foot washing, as, as low and menial of a task as that was, really was, was just foreshadowing a greater humiliation he was about to undergo. It foreshadowed the greater humiliation of going to the cross. And so think about this. It's really unfathomable that God himself in the flesh would serve his inferiors this way. I mean, let's make no bones about it. The disciples weren't great, right? And in fact, even if they were the best people earth had to offer, nobody can compare to God himself. And so Jesus, being God, serves his disciples and he challenges us that if we're going to follow him, we need to follow that same example. And so the irony is we think self-service is going to make us happy. We think you know, taking care of number one is going to fulfill us and make us content. And we start seeking our own pleasure, our own desires, our own comfort, and it doesn't make us happy. And the irony is true happiness is found in serving God and serving others. That's where true joy, true blessedness comes from, is from Serving God and serving others. And so this passage here in front of us is Christian Ethics 101. Christian Ethics 101. It's a, we might say, another reinforcement, a graphic reinforcement of the golden rule. What's the golden rule? I can hear everybody saying it right now, right? Do unto others as you'd want them to do to you, right? And so this is a, 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 an outworking of the golden rule, what Jesus is teaching here. And so what we see in this text is Jesus sets the example for us in humble service to others. Jesus sets the example for us in humble service to others, and we're going to study three keys that will help us follow Jesus' example in humble service. Okay, It's not easy to be a humble servant. Uh, if you look in the want ads, you're not going to see many people applying for the job that says humble servant. Right? That's not something that's easy, it's not something that's desirable, and yet that's what Jesus calls us to do. So we need some help to do that, and so we have three keys from our text about how we can follow the example of Christ. The first key is motivation. Motivation, our first key. Why should we live in humble service to others? Our flesh says, forget others, take care of yourself. The world says, forget others, take care of yourself. If you have anything extra, maybe you can share that with other people. Right? That's, that's what we see. So why should we serve others? Uh, let's mention a bad reason to serve others. Okay, Fear. Fear is a bad reason to serve others. Uh, so I'm going to read this passage here in John chapter 12, 13, 12 through 17. And you're going to see Jesus given a command. Uh, a command is an imperative. This is something you must do. And then they will strive to obey Jesus out of fear. Out of fear that, that God won't love them anymore. Or out of fear that they have to earn 
their acceptance with God or out of fear that they need to earn salvation with God and uh, that God doesn't love them. But we can't forget the context. Last week we saw Jesus humbly wash His disciples' feet. And what was His foot washing ultimately a symbol of? Well, the washing of the feet was clearly a symbol of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And so the imperative of washing each other's feet springs from the indicative that Jesus already washed our feet. Ultimately already washed our soul. Cleansed our souls from sin. So, I don't know if you remember this. Maybe it was last year I talked about how indicatives and imperatives work, right? The imperative, the command, comes from the indicative, the truth. Jesus washed us by dying on the cross. And because He died for us, we then should live in a way that's going to please and honor Him. So go back to verse 1 of chapter 13. We're told, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And we said last week that Jesus' love is unconditional. He died for us while we were still sinners. There was nothing you did to deserve Jesus' love. You weren't smart enough, you weren't good enough, you weren't wise enough, there was nothing. He didn't look ahead and see you and say, boy, that's a smart person, that's, that's a good person, I want them on my team. He loved you by his grace alone. And and it was only His unconditional electing love for us. That was the reason why He loved us. He loved us because He loved us. Not because of anything we did. So look at verses 12-14. through John says, When He washed their feet and put on His outer garments and resumed His place, He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You you call Me Lord and teacher, Teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And so, Jesus just completely shocked them all. He washed the feet of His disciples. It was unheard of for a teacher, for a rabbi, to stoop down at the dirty, disgusting feet and wash His disciples, His his students' feet. Can you imagine being in in school or in a college class and having your teacher or your professor bow down at you and start washing feet? Your feet. That would have been a very humbling, humbling experience for them. And so I just imagine all of the disciples just staring at Jesus with their mouths wide open and their feet clean. Like, what's, what just happened? Right? And so whatever he's going to say after he did that, because I'm sure it was, other than Peter going on, I, I'm sure it was pretty quiet in there. And so whatever he says next is going to have a lot of weight to it. And this is what he says. Do you understand what I've done? You call me teacher and Lord, and I am. He's not denying that. He says, I am. I am your teacher. I I am your Lord. And if I'm willing to stoop down and serve you in humility and wash your feet, then you need to follow that example. And so Jesus is setting this example of humility. He he had the higher rank. Jesus outranks everybody, but especially these guys, right? He had the higher rank. And he's not hanging around with Matthew, Peter, and John in order to learn from them. He doesn't need anybody to teach them. And so they're hanging around with Jesus because they need to learn from Him. And what's He teaching them? First, He's teaching that the greatest in this world are those who serve. The greatest are those who serve. Now, Now, this is critical. This gets to the heart of the Gospel. The foot washing pictures the Gospel. It pictures the Gospel. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, in verse 8, if I don't wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. Right? And then in verse 10, Jesus showed that the foot washing was emblematic. It was symbolic of the spiritual cleaning He was going to bring to them by dying on the cross. Jesus made them clean. He made them clean by dying for them on the cross. And He did that because He loved them. And so this is all foundational. Okay, We have to understand this. Because if we're going to follow Jesus' example of serving others and washing their feet, we have to realize we must serve others not to earn God's favor. You serve others not because you're trying to earn God's favor or twist His arm to like you or, or, or to love you. That's not We can't earn God's love. It's unconditional. We also need to realize we serve others not to earn our salvation. We we cannot purchase our salvation. We can't buy it. God is not weighing our good versus our bad and see if we're good enough to earn it. That's not going to happen. 
If we could scratch and claw our way to heaven some way, Jesus would not have come to this world and he would not have gone to the cross. If it were possible for you to earn your salvation by being good enough, we would not have needed Jesus. And so we need to realize that. We must serve one another not because God is measuring our good versus our bad, not because we're trying to earn His favor, not because we're trying to earn salvation. No, the motive for serving others must be gratitude. It must be gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. He has cleansed us. He has died for our sins. He has made us clean by faith alone through His grace alone. He has cleansed our soul by dying in our place. The call for us to live as followers of Jesus is not a call for us to impress people and impress God. The call to follow Jesus must be a response to the free gift of God's grace that He's given to us in His Son. And that's how God always, always works. I often point out to you, I think I do it a lot, that if you go back in the Old Testament... Think about the giving of the law. When did God give the law? Did He give the law before He saved the people from their slavery in Egypt or after He saved them from their slavery in Egypt? It was after, right? It was after. God did not say to Moses, okay, give them a bunch of rules and if they keep eight out of ten of the rules, then I'm going to save them. Right? Is that what happened? No. He saved them by His mighty hand, by His grace, by His power, and then as His holy people, He delivered them from their slavery and said, because you're my chosen people, because you're my holy people, this is how you should live. And in, in a way that would reflect me to the nations. And the same is true with the Gospel. It, it, it's, we don't earn it. We don't live a certain way, keep certain commandments in order to be accepted by God. He saves us by His grace, apart from anything good that we've ever done. And He says, because you're my chosen set-apart people, this is how you need to live. And this is the standard. Selfless humility that we see modeled in Jesus. You see, our motives matter. Now, other people don't see your motives. Only, only you know your motives. Sometimes we don't, we don't even know them. But God knows our motives. right? And our motives matter. So the call to live a selfless life of humble service can only come to those who have experienced the selfless, humble service of Jesus first. And so to be properly lived out, we must realize this is not a call. Jesus is not saying you serve one another because you're trying to impress me or earn something from me. You need to serve one another because I've loved you selflessly. And you need to share that love with others. And so, that's the first key to humble service. And that is motivation. Uh, Second key to humble service is fuel. Fuel. What do I mean by fuel? Um... Have you tried serving others? If you have tried serving others, you realize it wipes you out. right? You get legit burned out giving, giving, giving of yourself for the sake of others. Have you ever experienced that? You get tired. You start to run on fumes. And so you start to feel like you're tapped out, like you have nothing else to give. So what we need is a continuous source of fuel to help us live this self of this self uh, denying lifestyle, a, li- a lifestyle that's focused on others. So what fuel do we have? Look at verse 15. For I've given you an example, Jesus says, that you also do just as I've done for you. So the word example here also has the idea of pattern. He sets an example, he sets a pattern, he's shown us how we need to serve one another. So don't miss the crucial role humility plays in Christianity. Uh, if Christianity, if Christian zeal did not have humility, It'd be an ugly thing, right? If it wasn't matched with humility. And so Christianity is marked by humility. It makes our faith distinct. Jesus countered the prevalent thinking of his culture. The idea of humility was despised in the ancient world. It was a sign of weakness. A person's greatness in the ancient world was much like a person's greatness today. You know how people were were determined to be great or not? It was all based on how many people served you. Right? How many people are under you? That's how you can tell how great a person is. And Jesus just comes and completely flips that upside down and says, no, no, no. The source of your greatness is not how many people that serve you, it's how many people you serve. How many people you serve. And so he tells his disciples, follow this pattern. Follow this example. 
And so look, we need to talk about the foot washing here. Because when some people say this is the pattern he's given, there are some church traditions, some denominations that hold that foot washing is a sacrament, is an ordinance, that Jesus literally means we must follow this exact literal pattern even today. And so they have elevated uh, foot washing as the third sacrament alongside of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the question is, is that what Jesus is saying here? Is He elevating foot washing as a sacrament that the church is supposed to practice in perpetuity alongside of the Lord's Supper and baptism? Uh, we do not, as a church, as a denomination, hold that this is a sacrament. We believe there's only two sacraments or ordinances, and that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Why don't we think foot washing is to be continually practiced in perpetuity? Well, D.A. Carson writes this, Nowhere else in the New Testament or in the earliest extra-biblical documents of the church is foot washing treated as an ecclesiastical rite, an ordinance, or a sacrament. Foot washing is mentioned in 1 Timothy 5.10, but it's not as a sacrament. It was just listed as a part of a list of good works like hospitality. It's always a good rule of thumb not to make something an eternal sacrament when it's only mentioned once in Scripture. All right? When it's mentioned once, it's a good idea not to make this an eternally binding sacrament for the church. But also, I think, from a plain reading of Scripture, the issue here isn't really foot washing. Is it? I mean, the foot washing is a, an example of humble service, but that's the heart of it, is, is practicing humility from the heart. Because if it was just, hey, keep washing people's feet, that'd be kind of easy for us to fulfill, wouldn't it? You're like, okay, i got to wash people's feet. Okay, this is the day that we set aside the church to wash each other's feet. I mean, you might be grossed out by that, but you know, it's one day you could, you're going to suck it up and it's all, it's all done. Right? You did it. But if... Foot washing itself is not the issue here, and the issue here is humble service. Well, then there's hundreds and thousands of applications, right? There's hundreds of applications of how we can wash other people's feet today. And so that means we can wash other people's feet by forgiving them. We could wash other people's feet by submitting to one another. We can wash other people's feet by showing patience with people. How about that? We can wash other people's feet by becoming a good listener to people. Right? We could wash other people's feet by practicing hospitality and opening up our homes and giving of ourselves for the sake of others. We could practice uh, washing other people's feet by showing genuine kindness to people and genuine concern for those who are different than us and, 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 and showing love to clients and colleagues and customers and spouses and teachers and parents and kids, everybody. There's hundreds and thousands of ways that we are to follow this command of washing other people's feet. It, it ultimately means dying to self and actively looking for a way to be a blessing to others. And so there's, there's any number of applications we can bring, bring up for this to show how we can carry it out. But I want you to remember the context of the foot washing. What was Jesus doing in these chapters? John chapter 13 through 17 was all Jesus' preparation of his disciples. He's preparing them to go out into the world. He's preparing them for mission. He's about to leave. He's getting them ready to go and go out into the world to reach them for the good with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this, this model of humble service was so, so important. He's getting them ready for his death. And he's saying, I'm your Lord and I'm your teacher if I'm doing this. If I take on the form of a servant and I wash your dirty feet, that's what you have to do as well. Look at verse 16. Jesus says, truly, truly. What's that again? Amen. Amen. Right? That's solemn formula. But what he's, saying, what he's about to say is really important. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger. Uh, a little tidbit here. That's the Greek word apostolos. It's the only place in John's Gospel the word apostle is used. Okay, and, it, and here it's not even referring to the official office or title apostle, capital A apostle. Instead, it's referring to lowercase apostle. It literally means a messenger, one who is sent. And so Jesus says a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. So I always like listening to people talk about their bosses. 
I, I, I think it's fascinating. They, you, you can learn a lot by what they think about their bosses, their employers. You can learn a lot about what they say and what they don't say. Uh, one of the things I often say, uh, hear people say about their employers that they respect, maybe not like, but at least respect, is they'll say something like, you know, they would never ask me to do something that they wouldn't do themselves. Right? They would never ask me to do something that they wouldn't do themselves. Isn't that really what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, by, by definition, a servant is not greater than his master. An apostle, a messenger, is not greater than the one who sends him. So if the master is down in the dirt, washing the feet of messed up, right, disobedient people, how should you act? Right? If I'm willing to do this, you need to be willing to follow this example. If I'm caring for the, the people that are pushed to the margins of society, if my life is marked by this humble service, who are you? Right? Who, who are you? We, as the underlings, the followers of Jesus, must follow His example. So there's never a time or a situation where a Christian says, nope, that's too low for me. I'll do anything, but I won't do that. Right? That's, I, I can't, I, that's beneath my dignity. Right? Our master's most notable action in life was dying in the most humiliating way. Stripped all of his clothing, beaten to an inch of his life, nailed to a cross. And he says, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to follow me. You need to deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow me. And this blows a hole in any of that repugnant prosperity theology that says God only wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy and blessed in this life, living a prosperous life, because Jesus is constantly calling on us, deny yourself, follow me in humiliation. Deny yourself, follow me to Calvary. Follow me with your cross. And so Jesus washed feet and died as a sacrifice because He loves us. And we're called to follow His lead, love others, and count them better than ourselves. So let's get to the main point. I said, what is the fuel for doing that? What is the fuel for that kind of lifestyle? The, real, the, the, the realty is we are finite human beings. And so as finite human beings, you might have experienced this already, we have finite resources, right? We have finite resources. So how can we live a life of daily surrender, a life of daily service and, and humility without, quite frankly, getting burnt out? How, how can we give, 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 give to others without just completely burning ourselves out? So uh, think about it this way. If you are giving away your money, right? It's just every person you saw you're giving your money away too. Unless you had a a constant, steady stream of income, you're going to run out of money pretty fast. And you won't be able to give away anything to anyone because you'll be completely broke. You need that constant stream of income if you're going to constantly give away your money to people. And the reality is, if we're going to constantly serve others in humility, we need a constant source of love, a constant stream of love in our hearts if we're going to love them and serve them. Where does that come from? So Romans chapter 5, verse 5 tells us God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Okay? God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so I want you to hear that clearly. We, we get God's love in our hearts, poured into our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. So the reality is, when we say you need to serve others, you need to humbly bow down and serve others, I'm not telling you you need to manufacture love and humility from your own resources. You are not called to manufacture and, and make love and humility in your heart. The love and service we give to others is the love that God has flooded into our own hearts through His Son, by His Spirit. You're not giving away your own love. You are giving away the love that God has given to you in Christ. One of the signs that we're empty inside is that you're only able to love people who love you. If you're only able to love those who love you, you're empty inside. 
Think about that. You can only, if you only love people who love you, that means your heart is empty. It means you can only reciprocate what p- others give to you. And you're not able to give out of the resources that God is pouring into your heart. That's a problem if you can only love those who love you. And so how is it possible to have God's love poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit? First and most important, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever placed yourself in this, in this text? Okay, I want you to think about this. It's easy to read this and kind of detach ourselves from the text. We think, okay, there's Jesus. He's washing people's feet. Okay, oh, look, he's washing Peter's feet. Peter's yapping about it. Okay, that's normal. Oh, that, he's washing Judas's feet. That's, that's powerful. He's his enemy. Okay, uh, but it's always other people's feet, right? Have you ever stopped to realize that He's washed your feet? Have you ever seen the Lord and Savior of the world down at your dirty, disgusting feet washing you, making you clean? Because more than just your feet, He washed your heart. He cleansed your life. He took away our sin by dying on the cross for it. And that's why, that's why His interaction with Peter earlier in the chapter is so important. Peter saw Jesus down at his feet. And what did Peter say? Peter said, never! Never, Lord! You're never going to wash my feet. Right? And how did Jesus respond? He says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. You have no part with me. So, Jesus is not talking about just a foot bath here. Right? He's alluding to the washing of Peter's sin that Jesus had to accomplish on the cross. And so, if we want the love of God poured into our hearts, the first thing you need to do is realize that Jesus died for you to make you clean. He died for you to give you a home for all eternity in heaven. He did that for you. He's at your feet washing. He's, at, he's the one dying on the cross for you and in your place. So that's the first thing. If you want God's love poured in your heart, that's the first step. Secondly, if you've done that, you need to learn to delight in the Gospel of Jesus. You need to learn to delight in the love of Jesus. You must learn that one of the ways our hearts get filled every day is by meditating on what Jesus has done for you. Meditating on the Gospel. Preaching the Gospel to ourselves every single day. We need to think about the astounding reality that God has forgiven us in Jesus. That He loved us with an an eternal and unbreaking love. Ponder how He has chosen you by His grace. Praise Him that He suffered in your place. Rejoice that you are adopted into His family and you are His beloved. You are His beloved. Thank Him that the, the enemy, the devil, has no power over you any longer. That's fuel. That's fuel for humbly serving others. You're not manufacturing love in your heart. You are receiving the love of Christ. The Spirit is pouring into your heart and you're able to give that out to other people. You're able to share it and serve others. That's the power of what he says in verse 15. He says, I've given you an example. It's not just how we should do it. It's not just, okay, this is how you clean feet. It's also, here is the power behind it. Here's the fuel for doing it. And there's a third key to humble service. We saw motivation. We saw fuel. Thirdly, let's look at follow through. Follow through. Look at verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. First thing, Jesus says, if you know these things, we need to ask, well, what things? Well, first, that He's our Lord and our Teacher, that He humbly served us in love. If you know that, and if you see how He humbly serves others, you are blessed when you act like Him and humbly serve others as well. But also, there's, there's something else Jesus is saying here that's important for us to see. He's acknowledging an all-too-common situation. And that is, knowing truth is different than practicing truth. Let me, let me say that again. Knowing truth is different than practicing truth. They're not always the same thing. You can know something cognitively, and there could be no evidence that you know that in your life. It's not enough for us to know what we should do. We actually must do it. So, 
D.A. Carson puts this well. He says, there is a form of religious piety that utters a hearty amen to the most stringent demands of discipleship, but which rarely does anything about them. I'm going to read that one again, because that one, that one hurts. That one stings a bit, right? There's a, a form of religious piety that utters a hearty amen to the most stringent demands of discipleship, but which rarely does anything about them. So back in chapter 12, verses 47 and 48, Jesus warned about those who hear what he's saying, but don't do anything about his words. What did he say in those verses? He says, I don't judge you. I came to save you. But on the last day, my word will judge you. My, my word will judge you. So, so let's be clear. Be clear. You're not saved by your obedience. You're not accepted by God because of your obedience. But your obedience is proof that you're saved. And your obedience is proof that you're accepted by God. Faith and obedience are two sides of the same coin. True faith will always, always show itself in obedience. That's what the Bible says. You can't separate them out. And so to place faith in Jesus is to walk in humble obedience to Jesus. But don't miss what he says here. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. So, there's a blessing that comes with obedience. It's not why we're obeying, but there's a blessing that comes with obedience. The blessing does not here come with knowing. You see that? The blessing comes with doing. Right? The blessing comes with doing. So, this word blessed. Blessed could also be translated as happy. As happy. So, there's an amazing reality here. The world, the flesh... The devil wants us to focus on self. They say, look out for number one, you'll be happy. Seek out your own desires, seek your own pleasure, seek your own comforts, and if you do that, you're going to be happy. Follow your own heart, right? And you'll be happy when you follow your heart. But the end result of following your own heart and seeking your own pleasure and your own glory is misery. We need to hear this. Self-absorption is misery. It's misery. And yet, when we follow Jesus, love God supremely, love our neighbors as ourselves, and and humbly serve them, there's an inevitable happiness and blessedness and joy that comes from being outward focused. But even if even if you're miserable serving others, and I don't think that could happen, but even if that were the case, the idea of being blessed is is more than that. It refers to our condition before God. We are blessed. We are in a blessed condition before the eyes of the Almighty God who created heaven and earth. We are His children. We have been adopted into His family. We had our sins washed away. You are blessed. You are happy because you're in Jesus. And we can live a life following the pattern of Jesus because we're just seeking to share the love that He's poured into us. We're just giving it away. That's a blessed and happy life. So follow through. Follow through is key. It's not enough to know the truth. You can memorize your Bibles. The Pharisees had to memorize. They knew so much Scripture. right? But there was a disconnect between the understanding and the follow through. Right? It's not enough to know it. We must practice it. We must do it. And so here's Jesus' challenge to us. He takes the form of a servant. Here's God in the flesh down at your feet, washing your dirty feet. He washes us ultimately through His death on the cross, and His challenge is clear. If you say He's your Lord, if you say He's your Master, you need to follow His example. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to humbly serve others, our motives matter, our fuel matters, and our follow-through matters. Ultimately, it comes down to the Gospel. The Gospel has to be our motive The Gospel has to be our fuel. The Gospel has to be driving our follow-through to humbly serve others. The Gospel, knowing what Jesus has done for you, is the key for you to follow the golden rule. And so let me just leave you with this story. This this was given, uh, shared by James Montgomery Boyce. And he tells this young uh, story about a young Russian, the son of a close friend of Tsar Nicholas, who was caught stealing from the Tsar. As treasurer of a border fortress of the Russian army, the young man was to manage the Tsar's money and dispense wages to the troops. But he began gambling. 
and trying to cover his losses by borrowing from the army treasury. One day he heard that the gov government auditor was coming to examine the books. He sat down and he added up what he had taken. It was a huge, huge amount. He emptied out his own resources. He subtracted it from what he had owed and what he had taken from the account. And he noticed it was a massive discrepancy. So under the amount due, he wrote a great debt who can pay it. He couldn't. He knew he couldn't, and he knew no one could help him. So he drew his revolver and decided to kill himself at midnight. But as he waited for the clock to strike, he fell asleep. And while he was sleeping, Tsar Nicholas paid a surprise inspection. He saw the books, the despairing note, and the revolver, and he realized the young man had betrayed his trust. But rather than arrest the young man, he had mercy on him. He stooped and wrote something next to the man's note and quietly left. When the young man woke up, he picked up the gun, was about to pull the trigger, but then noticed something. He noticed next to his note, which he wrote, a great dead debt, who could pay? There was a single word written, and it was Nicholas. And then the next morning, a bag of coins arrived from Nicholas that covered the exact amount owed. I hope you can see yourself in that story. You see that before God, our Heavenly Father, we have been caught in the act, that we are guilty, and we could never, ever repay Him for our crimes, for our guilt, for what we have done. And yet, Jesus, by God's grace, took our debt, covered it in full on the cross. In fact, the final words John records is, it is finished. Tetelestai in the Greek. It's an accounting term. It means paid in full. Paid in full. And the reality is if you have received that, that payment on the cross, if you have received that forgiveness of that massive amount of debt that you had, you've received the love of Christ, then we are called on to go and share that love with other people and serve them in humility, count them better than ourselves, realize that we're just beggars who received a feast and we're just pointing the other beggar to where to eat. That's the reality of what we have in Christ. If you've ex experienced the forgiveness and undeserved love of Jesus, go out and share it with others. Let's pray. Father God, we praise You for the sacrifice of Jesus and how He has served us and loved us with an eternal, matchless love. And He has washed our feet he has made us clean. He has died for us on the cross. We are grateful for that great sacrifice that we do not deserve, that we did not earn. And I pray, Lord God, that You would r remind us or convict us of this truth and show us how we can then reach out with the love You've given to us and share it with other people. That we won't just struggle to obey commands in our own strength, but that we would utilize the, the vast ocean of Your love, the vast ocean of Your resources which You have given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we praise You for this gift that we could never even calculate. How undeserving are we? How gracious are You, Lord? We praise You for it. And now may the Lord of peace Himself give You peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.